Welcome to Full Prefrontal, the show that exposes the mysteries of executive function. This podcast is a collection of conversations about the role of the prefrontal cortex, which impacts your focus, planning, problem solving, emotional balance, and independence. So join us as we explore executive function and the science of learning. And now, here's your host, the founder of EXQ, Sucheta Kamath. Welcome back to Full Prefrontal, where we tackle all issues related to executive function, self-efficacy, and learning how to learn. And today we have a very special guest who is going to give us a bird's eye view or maybe satellite view on the earth uh, when it comes to education. He is my first superintendent who will be talking to us about education, learning, uh, teacher training, student preparation, and a uh, philosophy and principle of, of developing independent um, future um, generation, I guess. So it's a great pleasure to welcome you, John. Uh, Dr. John EDC is the, rec is the recently retired superintendent of Stockton Unified School District in Los Angeles, California, who happens to be also a celebrated state superintendent of the year, high school principal, and somebody who began his career as a teacher and a science teacher. He, is, he uh, was the board chair and former CEO of Reset, uh, which is an, um, an alternative prison for young men, uh, 18 to 25 in the Bay Area, California. And we share an interest there because I have a program that I run for recently released from prison, homeless population in Atlanta, adults who are trying to get back on their feet. And uh, John has served in many capacities, many schools. He has a, more than 30 years of experience in the field of education. But what he's known for is his creativity and innovation in that space. He is also an Aspen Fellow, one of my favorite institutes to learn uh, to become creative and gather information. I've been to uh, several Aspen Institute uh, organized events. And uh, he is, Oh, he has also served as the superintendent in residence uh, for the board center and facilitates work in the board academy while coaching a number of current and emerging national educational leaders. So, so welcome. Welcome. So sorry to put you through that long introduction there. It's a pleasure to spend some time with you. Yes. So let's start with this. So all my guests, I begin to ask them a little bit about their own childhood as a learner and a thinker. So what can, I, what can you tell us about yourself as a student? Um, how self-regulated you were, uh, when did you become aware of your strengths and challenges, and when did you actually come into this idea of taking charge of your learning? Yeah, so um, thank you. Uh, I, if I was a little boy today, I would have been absolutely diagnosed as ADHD. Really? Without a doubt. Uh, and so I would view myself as uh, brought up in a very, very traditional, pretty strict Irish Catholic family. Um, You're from Boston, and, right? Uh, yep. And uh, so um, I think that was interesting because my parents, particularly my father, was um, a very uh, devout Catholic um, in the, uh, for, for Catholics listening in the pre-Vatican two days. So Latin was and must was had to be learned in the household. Um, you said your prayers in Latin. You were an altar boy at church in Latin first before English. So, um, and um, my uh, we were always uh, offered another language as well. So, from an early age, don't ask me why French emerged, but you know it's not exactly uh, the language, but I can speak it and read it and um, converse uh, and. So I think this exposure to language at the very beginning was, was an important part of that. In schooling, I was primarily interested in things like sports and recess. Um, and I think uh, God blessed me with uh, a lot of ability, uh, but um, I didn't apply that uh, diligently. And so the notion of figuring out how to get things done was a struggle um, at the beginning. And where in sport and play, I figured that out very, very quickly. And it was a lifeline for me. Academics, not so much. And I, I think for me, it was a real turning point was high school, um, mm -hmm. without a doubt. 
I loved learning, loved it. Um, didn't always appreciate the rigor it took to be and scaffold your own learning. Um, but I was uh, surrounded by great friends and particularly an individual who was an amazing young girl at the time. And we have just celebrated 36 years of marriage. I met my wife the first day of high school. And Ooh. yeah, and she was completely the opposite. So when you think about executive function, like there's a little photo of her in the dictionary uh, about <laughs> that. And, and I think she just really insisted on being a coach, um, if there was such a word today. So um, where those lessons took hold was after high school in, in college and university. And that's when I, I truly began to understand that um, this is a 70-30 proposition. 70% is my responsibility and 30% is the opportunity that I'm given to apply them. Well, so it sounds like it, if nothing worked because of your ADHD, your self-awareness kicked in and mm -hmm. you're very probably very amiable boyfriend or you allowed her influence to take root. So that's pretty remarkable. Yes. Great maturity on your part because that's exactly what I see like ropes kids in if they found somebody who they trust or love or find that relationship nurturing. That's great. So yeah. let me talk to you about education. So since you began your journey as a teacher, what educational principle speaks the most to you? Oh, um, that I'm is many, many, but maybe you can share yeah, two or one. Really the top one or two, um, by far and away is that, um, I come to see the terrible, uh, consequences of making judgments about young people's ability and capacity based on anything but their ability and capacity. And I think that whether it is a primary language, whether it's a skin color, whether it's a circumstance of, um, of means or wealth in a household, whether it's a neighborhood, um, those are that, the thing I've learned is just how detrimental that is. The second is that overwhelmingly, when a young scholar didn't get something, that was my responsibility as a teacher and not theirs as the student. And so every misstep a student had was my opportunity to recorrect. I think those are the two principles that have guided me pretty much throughout my life. I love that because this reminds me of a conversation I had with a neuroscientist, Daniel Willingham, is learning a responsibility of the teacher or the learner, <laughs> you know? Yes, yep. we want the student to learn how to learn eventually, but by definition, learning is something you teach and is acquired. So if there's any failure or breakdown, that is because somebody has, uh, well, it, it, the teacher's responsible res ways to think about it is maybe I didn't teach you well enough. I yeah, so if, if we think about the great theorists and, and kind of the researchers in our field over the centuries, I would say that I've been most affected uh, by Lev Vygotsky and by John Dewey. Like without a doubt, those have had a huge impact on my life trying to deeply understand that. So what, what made you sound like you were a very passionate teacher? So well, what you. made you transition? I am. Yes, and, and uh, you continue to be. What, however, transitioned from direct one-to-one -one or group interaction with students to leading those who teach? So that's a big commitment to make or give up the joy that comes by being with students, right? So what were your motivations to switch to becoming a principal or eventually a superintendent? Truthfully? Yes. Mani? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> seeing really incompetent people in the shoes of the principal and saying, oh my goodness, this, this can definitely be done better. Really? Yeah. Just so examples. What did you see? Um principals who wouldn't know their faculty members' names, let alone student names, um, principals and leaders who just uh, seemingly did not make decisions deeply centered on what is best for young people, um, mm -hmm. either what advances themselves or politic or, or just um, working to cover up ignorance um, failing, I think, to stand in a moral center, uh, no matter what the consequence, those things really bothered me. 
I, I really like that. And I thought, so it kind of saddens me that they became principals without that particular aspect of their belief system was ever questioned or challenged. <laughs> so that's really bad. <laughs> so Jada, I'm going to make a gigantic and probably gross assumption by just looking at you. I am probably considerably older than you. And we're talking about a time where it was rare to see a woman as a principal. It was rarer still to be, see anybody of color as a principal. And it kind of was, you were a teacher, you were a coach, you then became an assistant principal, and then you became a principal. Um, mm -hmm. Where this kind of true testing of beliefs about how you lead wasn't part of the conversation. And I didn't yeah. really want to be any part of that. So what are we, what are, what are the principles that have held true even through the change of time going from, you know, 20th century to 21st century digital, uh, I mean, in person to digital curriculum and what are, what principles people should let go, but they're still hanging tight to, you kind of have alluded to that, but because that's what I want to get the next, uh, get our conversation in that direction that how do we identify challenges in bringing innovation in education? So, so what do you see we are getting it right and not getting it right? Um, they're easy for me to speak about because I don't think that we have completely been able to um, not, uh, not see this completely removed from education. So your zip code is not destiny. Mm -hmm. um, your parent or guardian or caregiver's checkbook is not the sign of your intelligence your language proficiency has got nothing to do with your capacity. Speaking English as a first language um, is not uh, dominance, or said another way, probably less uh, sensitive, not speaking English as a first language is actually not a deficit and it is not a disability. It's actually a gift. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last, of course, is um, your skin color does not determine um, your capacity. And so those things still haunt us. They haunt us structurally, philosophically, belief-wise. And until we get to a point where those things have no place in our construct of what a young person is capable of, um, it doesn't matter whether we have digital natives or non. It doesn't matter whether we have, uh, you know, quote, uh, universal enrollment or open schooling or not. Those forms of bias um, are deeply, deeply um, corrosive to a young person's abilities. You know, I, it's such a wonderful topic. I, I was in a webinar um, a few hours ago uh, called Schooling for Critical Consciousness mm. uh, and a conversation between uh, Scott Sider and Darren Graves. These are two researchers from Boston College and they were talking about uh, uh, fostering young people's ability to analyze and navigate uh, and challenge racial injustice through education. And, and can you imagine that now, uh, I mean, people are now bringing that into the curriculum, which uh, again, the, you know, there's so many barriers to knowing uh, what kind of challenges people are experiencing, those who are discriminated against, and what kind of role educators play, which is what I want to come to. But I'm glad that you, you kind of set the stage for that. So as a superintendent, you gained a national uh, recognition for your educational leadership, particularly because of the success uh, in significantly narrowing the achievement gap in low income and minority students and their peer, uh, as compared to their peers. So talk to us about what are Thank some of the struggles of a minority and low income, uh, low SES students uh, uh, that they go through in K to 12 public education? And what are some of the insidious causes that an average educator may not be able to imagine if they don't serve the, uh, in this population. Well, that's a, that we could talk about that for hours. Um, I, I, I certainly think um, that a, a good part of the, the struggle that young people see is um, maybe in three or four buckets. One is they do not, with the frequency needed, see themselves um, in their teachers or their leadership. Mm. And it's very difficult to think um, about opportunity if you can't 
visualize that. So if you think of yourself as an athlete, you have to see the play before it's done. Like we understand how that works. The same, it, the principle is no different. I can't see teachers who look like me and I can't see leaders who look like me. How could I ever consider myself to be like that? Number two, I think is um, otherness is, is probably a disease more horrible than the current pandemic that we're in. Um, otherness is uh, associated with, you know, I'm less than because of traits. Um, you know, there is structural inequality, there is policy inequality, uh, there is bias um, that is built into this. Okay, so yes, those things exist. What are we gonna do about those? And there's not nearly enough both raising student voice about the experiences they have in that and then actually doing something like about that around those pieces and we could give a ton of examples if you want to dig please deeper. do yes i would love that i, I think one of the pieces I think I it's said... the most um one of the most uh painful and yet seemingly incomprehensible examples um having been the privilege of being the superintendent for a very large district like Los Angeles Unified, one of the things that completely confounded me was um, when I, I first got there, there was huge disparities in suspensions and expulsions. And if you just looked at the data, you would think, oh my God, these schools are completely out of control. Like just, I was visualizing uh, something violent and terrible. Then you go visit um, 96 high schools and you go from classroom to classroom to classroom and you're like it's another planet like these young people are uh not active at all like uh it was actually the complete opposite like you wish they would act up then you would know that they were alive in the classroom but it didn't seem to make sense and so what we began to realize was okay let's take a look at suspensions and let's just take a look at the reasons because you have to code those things and overwhelmingly, like I mean 98% of suspensions, uh, let me do it the other way. A minority of suspensions were very serious problems. Young people do make very serious mistakes. Rarely, but they make them. Uh, they will act in a violent way. They'll harm someone. They'll use or distribute um, illegal substances or drugs. God forbid they'll use a weapon. Those are very bad things. And there are consequences for those. We can talk later about redemption, but there are consequences. If you bring a gun to school, you can't stay in school. And we got to figure that piece out. If you just look at it without understanding the specific reason for suspension, you would say, oh my God, all kids are doing this. And it was a tiny fraction. And the tens of thousands of other suspensions were very much lumped into category of willful defiance. And so I'm saying to myself, okay, so is a kid standing on a desk with a baseball bat saying, hell no, I'm not going to do my homework? I mean, that's being willfully defiant. Yeah. So I remember very vividly, vividly the day we took uh, over 900 of the suspension reports and read them. Failure to turn in homework, would not open book, would not pick paper up off a of floor, would not stop talking. And then it began to dawn on me, this isn't willful defiance, this is adolescence. Like, we're there to help and executive people. Dysfunction. I was going to say, game. that's exactly what it is. You have to build the structures of executive function uh, side by side with young people. It took us a long time, but eventually to say that no one could be suspended for willful defiance anymore. Like that is just not okay. Wow. That's an example. And that's not like 50 years ago. <laughs> it's like less than 10 years ago. Yeah, and you know, this, this reminds me of this, uh, uh, the Moffitt and group that did uh, research on, uh, they followed um, this particular town, and uh, I forget now, if uh, for 30 years, the number of students, I think there were 1,400 uh, students that were babies, and that they followed it for the next 30 years, and they found that one of the determinant of success was this these executive function skills, you know, they, those who have better self-control or were taught to have better self-control had better jobs, they had higher income, better health, successful relationships, fewer run-ins with law. And all of them had these common problems. Um, I think 1,000 kids and, and what they 
the the problem was they the kids at the time of high school graduation with stronger impulse control and executive function were less likely to make risky choices have unplanned pregnancies or drop out of high school now that research i mean 30 years they they followed these kids and i what i find is that research has not still taken roots in in the way we educate kids. We are not making teaching skills of self-control a priority. Uh, and I see that, uh, that I think one thing that was clear from, for me when, the, when I came across your work is you kind of made that a priority to understand why kids do the way they behave or what they do and what is the role of their, um, what is the motivation? Is it uh, the, complete defiance to take, take on society, or just, eh, I didn't think much about it, kind of attitude. Yeah, so I, 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 I think you are so spot on. So the first thing I would say is, A, I'm not an expert in this field like you are, um, or our neurocognitive scientists. What I am is um, uh, learned and intelligent, and then, and then have tried to lead with that knowledge. So with that being said, um, I believe a couple of things. One is, I believe we as human beings, and particularly as we are developing young human beings, we want to be seen. We want significance. We want to matter. We want belonging. Those things are deeply um, uh, important and moving. Hmm. So I'll take them, like to be seen, like vis visibly to be seen. Uh, you know, I matter. Um, to be heard, my voice matters. I actually have the same weight in the in the conversation that you do. Um, to be cared for and have regard, um, I, I don't think that needs much explanation um, uh, at all. And when we feel that those things are not um, the experience I'm having, um, we react. You're going to see me. I want you to know. Now, whether you're going to see me because I'm going to scream and yell or whether you're going to see me because I'm going to stand up and refuse to do something mm -hmm. or you can go down the line. And, and one of the things to do is, A, regard and decency are a bottom line. You don't earn those things. Those are the uh, fundamental platform for which we acknowledge all humans have, especially young people in school. What we teach is how to bring to bear things like voice, written or spoken, presence, visual or otherwise, um, challenge and acceptance in ways those have to be taught and they can be taught, mm. but they're first modeled. I don't believe that they can be taught without being modeled. Love that. So uh, how as a superintendent, uh, one conceptualize this, this being delivered. Um, do you, so for example, I think if I understand correctly, you were kind of in charge of 21 schools or close to more than 20 schools, I guess. So how, do you inspire? In Los Angeles, it was a thousand schools. Oh, thousand schools. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Know, my number was completely off. Okay. Right. What I'm, I mean, I don't even know how one does that, but salute to you. You do it with an amazing team who shares the exact same belief system. So tell me, what is it that, that, that process of confirming that people are sharing your belief? Or how do you make your belief transparent? And how do you uh, train the leadership to have the same vision of um, elevating the spirit and bringing this belief in your capacity that is yet to be tapped into as a top priority for me? That's what I'm committing to. Yeah. How do you inspire yeah. that? How do you transpire that? So I, I, I think in, in large systems where I've had the privilege of working most of my life, you, you just can't um, write an announcement or a memo or a poster. It doesn't work that way. Um, and then secondly is, you know, if you have 100,000 employees, you're not going to have an intimate relationship with them all. So You're running a Fortune 500 company. Exactly. I always, it, an eight and a half billion dollar budget, you always, um, I have always believed that the power of the principalship is incredible. They translate what senior leadership is trying to do into the home, to the school, to the teachers, to the students. And so you invest deeply in the principalship. You invest in their development. You invest in who they are. You invest if they stay in that role. Uh, like there is tremendous importance in, in, in that investment. And as I've said many times, that um, 
young people don't show up on campus and contrary to what we may hope, they're not checking out our latest Common Core Aligned lesson. <laughs> and they are not checking out our latest homework assignment or they're not actually examining deeply the consequences on the rule sheet on the board. What they do, however, is show up every day and stare you straight in the face and look you in the eye. And what they are checking out is not how you look or how you dress. They want to know, do you actually think that I could be you one day? That I could have a position where I earn a, 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 a beyond a basic income, where I'll have a roof over my head, where I will have health benefits, and I will have regard and matter. And then no matter what we say and whatever posters are up on the wall, what they vet and what we vet is your behavior and your actions. Yes. What we do is very, very important and how we act. And so the idea of does actual student voice matter? Does teacher voice matter? Um, do we not shy away from very difficult conversations? Um, do we have a guardrail to have those conversations where people who might have incomplete language on something but know that they care deeply about it have the same seat at the table as someone who might have more masterful language about something? I, 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 and, and then just a few non-negotiables. And that, that's, I, I think that's how we've done it. You know, so can you share what, are, what is non-negotiable? Do you, do you get a report on a principal's behavior or a teacher's behavior? Do you have a personal talk or is there like a policy? And I'm sorry, I'm asking these like a, a, a questions that I had not prior, prior to meeting you or interacting with you, I have not thought about because I thought somehow this infiltrates through the system, right? It's like adding a blue drop into the water and the entire water starts carrying the blue drop. The oh, water becomes I, blue, right? <laughs> yeah, I love that. I, 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 I am a big believer the way you do that is just side by side with principles. You're in schools as many days as possible. And if you're in senior leadership, the majority of your time is in school side by side. I want to see how you interact with students and parents and your faculty and your community. I want to see how, and how you challenge and how you support. And so you don't wait for reports and you do just in time coaching. Um, and you ask people to reflect on the experiences that they're having. Because um, you're also investing in growth at the same time. I'm a big believer that, you know, beyond overwhelmingly, I very met very few people who don't fall in this category. If we know how to do something better, we'll do it. We know what to do that is better, we will do it. And so people are generally doing the best they know how. And so the obligation comes is to let's consider this and try that. So sorry to what is just in time coaching? So just in time coaching would be an example um, side by side with the principal in the school. And I witness, I'm just going to put two things. One is an extraordinary interaction um, where I say to myself, boy, that is, that is really um, incredibly insightful. This principal saw a teacher uh, misusing language, struggling in the classroom. And the principal says, let's stop the class right now. Um, let's retry this. Let's try this right in the time teachers are experiencing it. I think that is a remarkable gift. Oh, I love that. If I walk away and a week later write the principal a note for that and thank them and mention it, I, I don't believe that helps. Just in time coaching is side by side and saying, um, uh, so, Jada, that was an extraordinary example of leadership for the following three reasons. How often do you do that? Make me smart on how that happens. Do your peers get to see you doing that? The same is true for a misstep. Principal um, either engages in a way where language was insufficient, uh, emotion governed intellect, and you wait a week and you send, boy, I, I wish that had gone better. That's not helpful. It's like, stop right there. We're not going to go to another classroom. I'd like to reflect on what happened. Why do you think this happened this way? What could have changed that? That's just in time coaching. It's like active compassionate feedback. It's right. calling out what could be better or celebrating what was done well so that it can be reinforced. 
So, no, the great Boston Red Sox teams do not wait for the end of season to review the great plays or the missed plays. <laughs> All right, yeah, I had yeah. to say that. <laughs> Since today is the first day of the season. You're such a Bostonian. You know, I lived in Boston for eight years. So, and that was my first city that I lived after coming back from India. So I consider Boston as my home. But Red Sox, I'm not sure. That should have been Red Sox here. But anyway, never mind. That, that's a different podcast. <laughs> that's a different. Pack your car, then we'll talk. <laughs> so my question is, Sounds like you're asking a lot. And I don't mean it, so let me help phrase this. Because asking people to bring their A game for some feels like a lot of work. <laughs> they want to pass, they would just they just want to go through life. And this is a, a this is a calling to become reflective, self-corrective, and intensely responsible for your actions every day. Uh, did you receive, do you get, did you get any pushback? Was this hard for some people versus easy for some? Uh, I, this may come across as cold. I don't mean it to. Um, that's life. Uh, if you don't bring your A game every day or don't get better every day, I don't want you near the most vulnerable children in America. You can do something else. That's fine. But for this work, you need that. Secondly is, I don't pay you. We take money off of people's kitchen tables every day in the form of tax dollars to pay you, most of whom can't afford to give it to us. And we convert that into salary and benefits. And the quid pro quo is every single youth will graduate college, career, and community ready. That requires an A game or working towards an A game. So I don't want to be apologetic. I want to be super clear about that. We're, uh, now, maybe there's another place, like, God bless, no judgment, just not here. Not with these kids. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think honestly, that kind of calling people to uh, perform, bring their excellence is so critical. As you said, the timing, we cannot waste any single moment. Give, give us an example of one of your most favorite uh, principal behavior or teacher's behavior that you said, ah, this is exactly how everybody should be doing it. Oh, um, I only wish I was as good when I first taught as some of the most amazing teaching I, I see regularly. Um, when you see a teacher in a classroom of 30 young people, I'm going to use like, um, I'm going to do two extremes, second grade and I'm going to use 11th grade. And, um, and you are able to, the teacher is, is generally whole group presenting a concept. And... Maria and Gustavo are just simply clearly not getting it at all. The ability for the teacher to see a miscue that this teacher instantly understood why this young person did not get it and how he or she presented it and then repackages it and presents it again because the young person got a miscue. That is amazing when you see that take place. As opposed to saying, you didn't get it, I'm going to go back and do the exact same way again, and then your problem if you don't get it the second time. It is astonishing how frequently young people simply do not understand what I am trying to present, mm. and that is my responsibility to represent it in a way. That, to me, is awesome. I think at the other end of the age spectrum, when I see teachers who are willing and, and, and put the incredible time in to make instruction both culturally uh, responsible um, and relevant uh, to young um, people, you are, you are providing simultaneously um, an affirmation of that person's experience mm -hmm. and total regard for that young person. Um, they are a peer in that they're both um, human beings on this planet. And they're in the coach and learner mode um, because they haven't mastered it yet. It is, uh, it's awesome to see those things take place on a regular basis. Wow, that, yeah, that does sound very, to me, simple, but like showing up and being extremely vigilant uh, to- It's hard to do this. It is really it's hard, very hard to do this. Yeah. And you have to, it's like incredible care you have to put into uh, 
that responsive teaching, you know, it's responding to the learner's reaction to the teaching, not the teaching itself. And so another that. way to think about this is the, we, we, we go into classrooms and people, the teacher is asking questions all the time. Mm -hmm. And there is a discernible difference in classrooms where uh, an adult is asking a question to see if you got what I said or what I know versus a question which elicits um, the ability for the young person to describe how they are learning it and what they have gotten from that. And it's additive and reductionist. And, and those are very powerful um, nuances in the way we ask questions. I'm asking a question for you to use your prior knowledge to come to a piece of new application knowledge which you don't currently have. Mm -hmm. Versus, I want to ask you a question to see if you got the answer. There's just two, they're two different worlds. Totally. So, how does all this translate uh, uh, for uh, a superintendent in when one we don't know if we are returning in person? Yeah. Or if it's going to be a hybrid versus virtual e-learning for the whole year. We don't know. How do we? How do you think? What are the, some of the suggestions you have for? leadership to track their teacher's ability to reach their children uh, when there's so many levels this can break down. And you know, you could just tap on Jimmy's shoulder in the hallway and say, come and see me now. And yes, just, right. you know, and what's the version of untucked shirt or uh, just you know, morose attitude that something wrong has happened or something is not going well. None of those cues are available to us as a community of teachers and educators. Um, this is such an important question. I really appreciate you asking this question a lot. Um, it is, we're learning how to do it like just in time because we have not had this experience before ever. Um, so two uh, at least guidelines for me, one has been your principals and your teachers, um, you just can't assume that it's going okay, and that my focus has to be how they're doing with the students. My focus has to be how am I doing with you first as an adult and part of my community, and then how you're doing with your students. Um, it is incredibly isolating. It's actually very frustrating. Um, it is uh, challenging us in ways that we can't imagine. And then lay on top of that, uh, everybody wants to do a good job. Like we, we know we want to do a good job, but we don't stay in this most of difficult professions, most honorable, but most difficult. You need to spend time letting people know that you care about them and that they're part of community. Now, whether that's a weekly town hall, whether it's a Friday video postcard, whether it is random calls, it is making sure that they know um, that they can hear your voice and that they can see and talk to you. If that takes place with some degree of persistent and consistent, it will provide support so that the other part of your question can get attention. How do I work with young people in a way where I can't see them? Same thing, if this is once a week, I send home to every single home, to every parent, guardian, or caregiver, a small video postcard. Hey, no, this is really tough. No, we can't be outside. No, I can't see you. Um, you are very much on my mind. Uh, I was thinking of this memory from last year. I think constantly anchoring people into what was normality for young people, and that eventually it'll return, is really important. And then there's the, you know, the concrete steps, and that is, like, are you making one-on-one -on -one contact with every student you have if you have, like, elementary um, once a day? Um, does it take place once every other day for a high school? Uh, are you having um, small group connection that are checking on how you're navigating instruction in this method, as opposed to just are you engaged in the instruction? Mm. Um, do young people have the supports they need that are beyond my ability? I'm not a clinical social worker, but I know how to get you a clinical social worker. If your mom has passed and your dad is sick of COVID, from COVID, and you are uh, a driver trying to bring money to the table as a junior, I, I, you need to talk with someone. And like, we can do that piece too. And yes, we do have chemistry we have to learn. They're just never going to be separate. 
you you just sound to me are, are really uh, talking about that social emotional uh, needs of the person, the te parent teacher pair, and the community who had who's very very cognizant of this happening to all of us. So there's no let let's do something to you so that you get through learning. It is just we we are all trying to survive. And I really appreciate that kind of uh, thought process um, because I think um, it's like, uh, you remember, <laughs> this may not matter to anybody, but um, I was thinking the two significant events uh, that I have deep carved memory for is the 9-11. Yes. Uh, I remember where I was. I remember what I was doing. And yep. Princess Di dying for some reason. That's another <laughs> And that's why I said, I'm warning people. This is not like very, you know, <laughs> sensational. They're less but, memories of the latter, but very clear memories of the former. I, I, I just, I, uh, the reason I'm mentioning that, I think young people who are K, in K-12 education are going to remember what happened to them during COVID. This oh, is people, most people, yeah, most people in California, I remember March 11th. They're going to remember, yes. that was the last day I was in school. Like, yeah. I get it. And there's loss every day, and then there's actual loss every day. Yes. And so this is, you're absolutely right. The, the difference was, if I could just be so cold for a second, Princess Diana died, and she died on one day. It's like she didn't die every single day. Yes. 9-11 happened, and it was horrific. I mean, whole family lived, I have family living in New York City, awful. It didn't happen every single day. It yeah. happened once. We, young people are experiencing a, a sense of catastrophic loss every single day. Every single day, I don't play a sport. Every single day, I know someone who's gone to the hospital. Every single day, I learned someone who has died. Every day, I don't get lunch. Like, these are like, it is, it is unlike almost anything else I could ever remember. It's so heartbreaking. And as we come to uh, the end of our conversation, I do not want to let you go without talking uh, to us about homelessness uh, and homeless high, uh, school children. I think people in middle class of America or anybody slightly above whatever the lowest uh, social economic class that American can define has no idea because it's not in their face. And maybe COVID has made people aware. I think, I don't know if you saw uh, the conversation uh, or there's somebody opened a Twitter account called uh, Rate My uh, li Home Library or Rate My Bookshelf or mm. .com, which is silliest thing. But people, once you got on the Zoom calls, based on what's in your background, you could tell how red this person is. But imagine that also was one of the places people became aware of the economic disparity in, uh, based on how people were living. Yeah. So we don't know how people live. We don't visit people in their houses. And then there are students who are, don't even have a ha home, don't even have internet, don't even right. have access to their personal tablet or personal computer. How does, uh, just paint a picture for us, what does that homelessness in, in uh, school communities look like? And what does that mean to educate these children and these families who are putting their children and this is the only source of their relationship to the world where they, there's a possibility of change that can come? It's devastating. It is absolutely devastating. And it's incredibly compounded at the moment um, because it's very difficult <clears throat> to get people to routinely visit young people where they're homeless or their parents. It is such a understandable risk of disease in contracting this. And then second of all is um, it, it, people feel tremendously isolated. Um, no one is gonna zoom in from a tent. No. Like it's really frightening. And when you have very, very high numbers of individuals who experience um, home insecurity, shelter insecurity and outright homelessness, like this is, it is a time to rethink policies around that piece. Like this is not left for just like some 
organization and government to deal with. We have to deal with this in education as well. But what I can tell you is um, kids are uh, simultaneously scared and ashamed. Uh, students are simultaneously worried um, and isolated um, and know that while lots of kids have great experiences in school and many have bad days, when I talk with youth who, who um, are in conditions of homelessness, no matter how bad life is, there is a sense of safety and routine that takes place when I go to school. And now if that last thing is removed, uh, it's, it's, it's just dead serious. And so it is organizing individuals, it's organizing groups of us professionals to go uh, visit homeless encampments, to visit shelters. Um, the power of being proximate, even with social distancing, is, cannot be, um, can't be explained as powerful as it is. That so makes me really depressed. I think uh, I'm I'm working with a community here, um, uh, a nonprofit that's helping children uh, who are in low SES and and trying to provide support through baseball, um, personal development opportunity from middle school till um, thirteen, uh, grade thirteen, yep. which is pre college or college, whatever that looks like. And um, just take simple example of summer, um, most, you know, economically secure families were able to accommodate their children being home or yeah. maybe something in the neighborhood. And these children, the only source of their, com to their community and food was through this summer activity that was planned for them that completely shut down. Yeah. And, and these kids, uh, the baseball fields um, the, in our state were closed. Uh, public um, gyms were, I mean, school gyms were not available. So they were meeting um, in open spaces with no trees. So again, that, that I mean, that day in and day out, they, ha they would have to, this organization would have to wait. If the troopers came, they had to re relocate because the, it was not allowed to congregate, which obviously for safety reasons. But that, I mean, that's the closest I would say I have come on a, such a, in my face, that awareness of what kind of challenges these are. I, I really appreciate you talking uh, to us about all these complex matters and, and uh, I salute you for uh, having the courage and, and direction or creating direction for many who rely on you to uh, find that uh, mission that comes from passion and conviction. Uh, I thank you for being on this podcast for Prefrontal, exposing the mysteries of executive function and this conversation again has once again sealed my belief that we must teach executive function intentionally and empower the teachers to develop their own executive function, particularly the emotional regulation that's yes. so critical to manage uh, students who come at various levels of preparedness. So thank you so much uh, for joining me today. My pleasure. Thank you for being a voice for this incredibly important work. Thank you, and thank you for listening again, tuning in, everybody, and please uh, follow us on our social media. If you like what you heard, please recommend this episode to your friends, and once again, be well, be safe, and take charge of that brain of yours. It's very important. Have fun. Thank you for listening to Full Prefrontal, exposing the mysteries of executive function. To contact your host, Sucheta Kamath, and learn more about her work on improving executive function, visit her website at exqinfinitenowhow.com. That's www.exqinfinitenowhow.com. Tune in next week for another informative episode of Full Prefrontal, hosted by the founder of EXQ, Sucheta Kamath.